Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is John Semley. I'm a journalist who writes about psychedelics for Wired and The Guardian and some other places. Uh, we're here to talk about the promise and pitfalls of psychedelic medicine. I, I have a question out of curiosity. Well, first I have a question before that question. Is anyone here associated with the Drug Enforcement Administration? No, okay. Then my other question is, has anyone here ever had a psychedelic experience? A couple, or are curious about it? Well, they're in increasing supply these days, and it's something we're gonna talk about. To start, I'd like to get our panelists to introduce themselves, starting here. Uh, I'm Lina Shiebuden, I am a psychiatrist, a geriatric psychiatrist, and I also practice hospice and palliative medicine. I did uh, a whole bunch of research on the uh, uh, potential benefits of uh, psychedelics years ago in patients with chronic mental illness. And to my right? Hey everybody, uh, Dan Carlin, I'm also a psychiatrist, so just buckle up, we're gonna be doing a group session here between us apparently. Uh, also boarded in addictions and clinical informatics, and I am the chief medical officer at MindMed, which is a uh, company that was founded on psychedelics, but uh, has slowly evolved into a more robust uh, brain health focused biotech. Well, I guess I forgot to say, currently I am the chief population health officer for RWJ Barnabas Health, which is our biggest health system. And, and I have my boss over there, Dr. Anderson. <laughs> and I think we represent the uh, larger tri-state area being Jersey, New York, and myself from Philly, home of the 4-0 undefeated Philadelphia Eagles. Um, now, psychiatry is key to this conversation. I'm sure many of you have heard this term, psychedelic renaissance. If you've read Michael Pollan's book or watched the Netflix series, uh, you'll know that we're living in a moment of increased enthusiasm around psychedelic drugs, including what's called classical psychedelics, such as LSD, DMT, mescaline, psilocybin, which is the magic part of magic mushrooms. Uh, but really, this renaissance, it doesn't really go back to, you know, the 60s and Haight-Ashbury and stuff like that but to the 1950s when these drugs were originally conceived as treatments for a range of mental health issues. Uh, before there was the word psychedelic, there was the word psychotomimetic, which meant that these were drugs that mimicked psychosis. Uh, eventually they learned that it would be better to not make patients go insane, uh, so they tried to establish kinder, gentler treatment protocols. Um, with that little setup, I wonder, Dan, if you could kind of tell us where psychedelic psychiatry is at right now, how these compounds are being used within psychiatric treating, treatments and settings. Yeah, so I think it's important when you start talking about this topic to point out that I, I can't remember in my career, and I was at Pfizer developing psychi psychiatric drugs. I've, I've been involved in psychiatry for quite some time, as have we both. I can't remember the last time that the general population was interested in a phase two asset, right? We've got drugs in our pipeline at entering phase two or having recently entered phase two. Compass is heading toward phase three with psilocybin. MAPS, the uh, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Research, even though their drug isn't a classic psychedelic, MDMA, is uh, in phase three and, and heading toward an NDA submission probably middle of next year. Yet here we are at a non-medical, non-clinical, non-pharma conference talking about these drugs. So what's the state of the treatment? It's not available to you for the most part is the reality and it's not gonna be for at least a few years. So, so like a hardcore reality check on where we're at and what can reasonably be expected. Now that said, one of the reasons I think that we're so excited about these drugs is that psychiatry has abandoned you. And that starts you can track a kind of a long history of this, but we had barbiturates for anxiety, but they killed you if you drank, you know, took them too much or with alcohol. So we had this horrible barbiturate overdose epidemic. We got benzodiazepines that seemed really safe relatively. Uh, turns out now many years later, they're not necessarily so safe in long-term use. And then in 92, we got what? Zoloft, right? And so suddenly we had a drug it kind of worked for some people some of the time, and not to say it didn't save lives along the way, but why did we suddenly just start to talk about depression instead of anxiety with the release of Zoloft? Because Zoloft doesn't work as well for anxiety as benzodiazepines. So Pfizer, in their infinite wisdom, looked at that marketplace and started telling you via your TV that everybody worries, but 
major depressive disorder means you have a chemical imbalance in your brain. Now, what they wouldn't, the last little quiet part was that the chemical imbalance is you don't have enough Zoloft in your brain, you should take Zoloft. At that point, there was an 80% diagnostic drift from anxiety disorders to depressive disorders because they have an 80% construct overlap. So if I see you in the office, I can diagnose you with either one, kind of depending on how much I want to protect myself when I give you the drug that's labeled for one or the other. And at the same time, we saw psychiatry switch from doing psychotherapy, which we are trained in and generally pretty good at, as I imagine you are. We handed off psychotherapy to people who make a hell of a lot less money than I do. And we gave them manualized psychotherapies that got just as bad outcomes as SRIs. Right? We turned Freud's talking cure into symptom reduction at four and eight weeks. Symptom reduction largely measured by your behaviors. And we stopped calling it departments of psychiatry. We stopped calling ourselves psychiatrists. And we switched to this nomenclature of behavioral health. It's gross, right? You're not concerned so much with your behaviors as with your rich internal life, right? Each of us contains one. It's a terrifying thought that everybody has that much inside of them as much as you do or I do, right? But psychiatry abandoned that inside. And we focused on symptom reduction at four and eight weeks because that's how you get a label for an SRI and all the drugs that have followed. I think this excitement is largely oriented around the thought that maybe someone is coming to help. So, so that is really the westernized medicine view of psychedelics. I mean, I'm sure in your research, psychedelics have been around for thousands of years. Uh, you know, the ancient uh, Eastern uh, cultures all use them, the Greeks, the Indians, um, I mean, Indians in India, the, our Native Americans, the mushrooms. Uh, so um, the, they were mostly used for both healing powers, because, you know, depression, anxiety, OCD, all these things existed thousands of years ago. So they were all treated with these medications and these, there's these compounds, and which are all plant-based, now there are some synthetic ones, uh, were used to really transcend the, you know, the, what the mind can do. And really, for those of you who have tried it, uh, I, I know very close patients who have tried it, they describe it as it opens your mind in no way they've ever experienced. You can see things differently, you can experience things differently, you can feel things differently. It really heightened all your senses, and that's why it is used to heighten that sense to be able to effectuate that psychotherapy. That's really the studies which, you know, it, on the Western medicine side of things. Now, we all know, I mean, we, you know, the Beatles, right? Their creativity, Yellow Submarine, they were all high on LSD, right? Van Gogh, you know, I mean, it, it gives you really different dimensions of your brain, which you may not even be aware that you have. Can, can I, I, can I, I will say that the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre took mescaline and believed that giant human-sized lobsters were following him around. So it's not all yellow submarine and uh, purple haze. Well, I mean, yellow submarine is pretty psychotic, too. Uh, but the, uh, There is something we have to be pretty careful about. And, and if you're someone who follows the industry, you see a lot of claims made about mechanism. Now, we know the mechanism by which psychedelics trigger the acute experience, right? It's a specific serotonin receptor, gets activated pretty hard. That leads to a period of an acute response that is kind of defined by the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the drug, how long it spends on the receptor, how tightly it binds the receptor. We have no idea how these things work to alter long-term mental state. Now that's okay for a bunch of reasons. We still don't know how SRIs work. Right? So it's okay, and we've been prescribed to millions of people and, in, and been in hundreds of thousands of people in well-controlled studies. So not knowing the mechanism is okay, but anybody making claims about modifying the, the, the drug or modifying the environment or anything like that is getting ahead of the science. We don't even know if the trip is important. Right? It might just be that these drugs work via neuroscience. Well, let, let's talk about that because as you mentioned, these are ancient medicines in certain respects. If you go back to the Eleusinian rituals, which some believe Plato took part in, which involved ergotamine, which is a precursor to LSD, uh, indigenous rituals around ayahuasca, around magic mushrooms, which really white Westerners did not take part in until the 1950s when a banker from J.P. Morgan who was interested in mushrooms went to Mexico and tried it. 
And yeah, as you say, Dan, we don't really know, I guess, how much of this is the medicine, the pharmacokinesis, and how much of it is, quote, the trip treatment. But I think what's interesting to people for our purposes, assuming we're not all high-level chemists, uh, is this trip treatment. So can you kind of walk me through, if I show up at a clinic or to a clinical trial or to a hypothetical clinic that MindMed or Compass or another company might be running in five or 10 years, what would this mode of therapy look like? It's, it's actually quite hard to know. And there are two really distinct schools of thought on this. One school says, well, look, this works via the experience of the trip. And the more you do around that to set people up for it, to form intention before it, through what looks a little bit like psychotherapy, but has a very different flavor to traditional psychotherapies. So the more of that you do, then the trip experience happens, which is largely inward looking. The, the person sitting with a person during a classical psychedelic trip is kind of just there to remind the person who's having the experience that if they get kind of anxious and worry this might not go away, that no, it's drugs. Like you took drugs and now this is drugs and it's gonna go away. And then there's something that people call integration afterwards, very poorly defined, but it has something to do with trying to uh, come to terms with, understand, uh, internalize what happened during the trip. So that's one model. Uh, at MindMed, we've, we've taken a very different view, which is that we're trying to really strip down all that surrounding and reduce this to something that looks more like a drug. So there's there's obviously education before you get any drug. There's informed consent. You should get before any drug that you get for any reason. There's the experience of the trip, during which time we, we have people we call session monitors who sit with the person who's undergoing the experience and mainly to reassure them and to help make sure that they're completely safe during the experience. And then afterward, the person goes about their life. They come back to the, the research site, they complete questionnaires. They may want to talk about the experience and that's totally okay, but we don't have any sort of structured, what you, what you might call integration. And that's largely because FDA doesn't regulate the practice of medicine. They don't regulate the practice of psychotherapy. FDA cannot approve or not approve or really even comment on psychotherapy. If you look at other drug labels that require some form of counseling or therapy, something like Vivitrol or Suboxone, the label itself says this medicine should be given in the context of a robust program of counseling. Okay, that's minimal regulation. So we don't see a path to a label that includes specified psychotherapy. We're developing a drug. And what we do on the other side of that is try to build systems and programs and trainings that can enable real providers who exist in the real world who provide other treatments today to adapt these treatments into their practices as well. Yeah, so hopefully with the scientific research, you'll be able to appropriately dose. You'll be able to say, this is the drug, very similar to what ketamine went through, right? I mean, we always knew ketamine as an anesthetic, right? You have a very big, large, psychotic individual, nothing can bring them down. And ketamine, which is supposedly a hallucinogen in, in the realm of psychedelics, not as, much as LSD, you give them ketamine, they quiet down and the appropriate dose, right? So hopefully with the research that you guys are doing, you will be able to dose it appropriately and administer it safely. But there's also the demystifying of, oh my God, we are giving people psychedelics, right? And you're giving them to patients who are mentally ill. You're giving them to patients who have a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncontrolled depression. So it, it, it kind of like sometimes people are like, what are you doing? You're giving them all these drugs, uh, potentially, doing more harm than good. Now, the issue of the psychotherapy piece, hypnosis was also, I mean, in hypnosis, we put the patients in an altered state of mind, right? Psychedelics put them in an altered state of mind very quickly, much easier than uh, hypnosis. So that would be the benefit of putting a patient in a state of mind where their mind is more able to understand and be malleable to what you're offering as psychotherapy. Now, I don't know if it will never be regulated in that context. I mean, I don't see psychologists just giving patients, you know, some LSD and doing therapy at the same time, but we will see where that goes. I wonder about this idea of malleability because it can have, to me, it conjures these ideas of the CIA LSD treatments in the 50s where patients are being reprogrammed or something like that. But as I understand it, based on the word psychedelic, which means mind manifesting. Uh, it's more about the mind sort of revealing itself and its own mysteries. I mean, Dan, is there a way, can you walk us through what happens in that process? First of all, what indications are being uh, pursued for psychedelic treatment? Uh, and B, how much of it is about 
a therapist there kind of guiding someone by their hand? And how much of it is about the patient reckoning maybe with deep-seated traumas, finding out the core threads that are causing anxiety, depression in their lives, and pulling at those threads and hopefully untangling them? Is that a mixed metaphor? I don't think so. No, I think that was a perfectly unmixed metaphor. What do we call a non-mixed metaphor? Just a metaphor? Um, okay, let me put bookends up here, right? Ketamine, dissociative anesthetic, as you mentioned, has almost no relationship to psychotherapy. It has the same relationship to psychotherapy as SRIs do. If you do SRIs plus psychotherapy, people get incrementally better than from one or the other, for the most part. Ketamine and S-ketamine has the approval. S-ketamine is just one enantiomer, if you remember from chemistry class. Ketamine's a mixed salt, so it's got two chiral molecules. And nope, nobody remembers. Okay, and S-ketamine is just the left chiral molecule. Uh, that has a label. Ketamine's only labeled as a dissociative anesthetic. But what it seems like is if you give people with high levels of depression and or suicidal ideation ketamine, they get better for a brief period of time. You give it again, and eventually you can sort of space those out and they stay better. Psychotherapy, I, look, I'm a psychotherapist. I think psychodynamic psychotherapy is one of the best inventions humankind has come up with. That's great. You can do them both, no relation. MDMA, on the other hand, so treatment-resistant depression, suicidality on ketamine. MDMA, which MAPS is developing now, is a session-based dosing paradigm where someone takes MDMA and has psychotherapy. There's no evidence that MDMA on its own helps PTSD. So if you go out and dance and take MDMA, you may feel some temporary relief from whatever it is that's bugging you, but you're gonna go back to how you were the next day. There's some evidence you do worse, there's other evidence you don't do worse, whatever, we'll leave that alone. So MDMA plus psychotherapy helps with PTSD is the evidence we're seeing. In the middle, you've got these classical psychedelics, which you can think of, let's say the experience matters, could be autotherapeutic. Right? You do the psychotherapy on yourself during the session, plus minus some amount of psychotherapy around it, or it's like ketamine and it just helps, and then psychotherapy helps more. We don't know the answer to that. That's being developed across treatment-resistant depression, generalized anxiety disorder, a bunch of substance use disorders, anorexia. So that just goes on and on and on and on. That, and that's, that's great, right? We wanna test this against as many conditions as possible. The idea of neuroplasticity or malleability has been blown a little bit out of proportion, and here's why. The only reason that you're gonna remember what I said today, if you remember anything at all, is because of neuroplasticity. Your brain is constantly, this is what Eric Kandel got the Nobel Prize for, demonstrating that memory depends on structural changes in the brain. And there are lots of drugs that increase neuroplasticity. There's some that decrease neuroplasticity. So that's not novel. What may be novel is the kind of, the type of, and the duration of enhanced neuroplasticity that classical psychedelics introduce, which if in fact the psychotherapy is relevant or they're additive, is probably because of that specific bit of neuroplasticity that, that these things induce. Now, the, the quick little scare thing there, you know, this idea of malleability or suggestibility, probably blown a little bit out of proportion. Otherwise, the CIA probably would have kept doing what they were doing if it was working. And there's not a lot of evidence yeah, but, it was but, working. But, but we do have to, I mean, we do have to acknowledge that that potentially fall, falling in the wrong hands. I mean, listen, a lot of those cult leaders, you know, those Joneses of the world, that's what they did. They, and, and it depends on the patient. It depends on the person. There are people who are more, uh, you know, malleable than others, more suggestible than others. That's also, I mean, that's the same danger with hypnosis. You put some people under hypnosis and you can, you know, make them go commit a crime and they will never remember when you wake up, they wake up from hypnosis. Um, so it, it potentially falling in the wrong hands, it can do really bad things. Just like you were saying, you know, the, the adding the NMDA plus psychotherapy makes psychotherapy more effective. So the NMDA did something to the receptors so that the brain is able, I mean, listen, you can do psychotherapy for 25 years and move this much, right? You do NMDA. That, that, that's not very good psychotherapy. Well, uh, if I'm, you're in psychotherapy for 25 years with the same psychotherapist, get a new psychotherapist. Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Some, some psychotherapists, you know, they, uh, the, patient, the patients are inherited from one to the other. Get a new psychotherapist. Right. <laughs> but, but my point is the NMDA really enhances that ability of that therapy to really help the patient. So it is doing something in real, in real time, right? In my research, I find a lot of these treatments are, especially as they're being patchworked together in a still federally illegal landscape, fall outside of the traditional healthcare system. 
Uh, Oregon recently decriminalized psychedelic drugs and is setting up these licensed therapy clinics. The people who are licensed aren't necessarily doctors in a traditional or non-traditional sense. Uh, Colorado's on track to do, uh, pass a similar measure, I think, in November. Senator Scott Weiner in California has been pushing similar legislation. Uh, what are, yeah, and sorry, even beyond this, you know, I know people who have gone to retreats in Jamaica, Mexico, to do 5-MeO-DMT and smoke toad venom and everything else to cure any malady under the sun. I don't know if there's anything wrong with that per se, but what are the potential pitfalls of creating essentially an alternative medicine ecosystem that's becoming highly trendy uh, that stands outside of the current medical landscape? It, it, got to tread carefully here because there are people who sustained enormous benefit from illegal use of these substances. De definitely. Yeah, and I'm not yeah. saying because it's illegal, it yeah. means that it's wrong and people have done this outside of the law for generations and seen great benefit naturally. Yeah, I think, I think what I would argue is that legislature probably shouldn't decide if drugs are effective, right? We saw the medicalization of cannabis that has no medical use and has never in a well-controlled study been shown to be beneficial for any condition long-term, all right? So when we, I mean, we don't have a social safety net, right? We have long-term disability because it's much more palatable to our government to medicalize a social safety net than to just help poor people. So be really careful when the government says this is medical and doctors are going, eh, I'm not so sure, because then you get false medicine. You get medicine that doesn't have a known use and the people are using may benefit them transiently. They may think they're sustaining a benefit, but it may actually be harmful long term. So some of these legalization efforts, while I don't think are necessarily cynical or wrong handed, are not the way to develop treatments. Yeah, no, For I what it's worth, the legislators always say the opposite. They say, we should not listen to the doctors because the doctors all work for big biopharma companies who want this stuff to be legal so they can sell drugs. It should be decriminalized as a civil rights well, issue. Well, the truth is somewhere in between. I mean, again, the truth is somewhere in between. We know that some of these substances, uh, plant-based substances, have been used for thousands of years. And not everybody became psychotic on them and not everybody developed schizophrenia because of them. So the truth is somewhere in between. We don't want it you know, totally, totally legislated and totally, you know, regulated, but you got to go do some sort of regulation around it. Um, but then again, sometimes when you regulate it, that's how you invite a lot of abuse of substances, right? Because now it becomes regulated and, you know, people get arrested for having it. And I mean, it's a whole slew of things. And it's definitely, psychedelics are definitely not as benign as pot or weed or marijuana, so. Yeah. <laughs> Do you disagree? They are not. So classical psychedelics are, in, are incredibly safe. The acute experiential period has been treated as if it's some period where people are throwing themselves through windows and stuff. And I'm not going to say that's never happened, but the anecdotal reports of that happening came from a time when the media was very much primed to repeat the government line that these things are dangerous. Physically, they're incredibly safe. There's more evidence that marijuana is correlated with the development of schizophrenia than the psychedelics are. People do not develop schizophrenia as a result of taking psychedelics. They may as the result of smoking too much marijuana may, during the critical trigger, period. It may trigger, I mean, schizophrenia is a genetic disease. You don't develop it, you're born with it. And, you know, something triggers it. And pot triggers it as much as psychedelics. Um, but I'm not sure how benign is it at, at different doses. Again, if you're getting it from a plant, I don't know that. I mean, I, I worked in a, with a lot of Native Americans. I've never seen anyone really overdose on the mushrooms. You just don't. You know what I mean? Um, but now, we, you know, you can overdose on PCP. You can overdose on LSD. You can uh, overdose on some of the synth synthetics. So that's really the... If we're just going to say to people, grow a little bit in your backyard and chew it and smoke it or eat it or whatever, that's one thing. But if we're going to start saying, here's regulated, this is in a pill form, and now you're going to have 180 pills and overdose on them, I really don't know. I don't know that anybody knows. Aren't many of these harms actually situational in the sense that, you know, I would not advise anyone drives a car on LSD. That would not be a wise idea. Well, I mean, But I've never really heard of anyone overdosing on LSD. I mean, the, the psychopharmacology of it, as you're saying, is relatively safe, but there are harms that can be associated with the use and the context no, no, no. of that if, use. Listen, PCP in very, very high doses will cause you a heart attack, will cause you an yeah, encephalic brain yeah, let's, damage. Let's, yeah. PCP, no one's developing PCP for a bunch of reasons. There, there are a few reported overdoses of LSD, but it was people insufflating, does everyone know that word, uh, snorting 
pretty hefty lines thinking it was not LSD. And so we're talking 1,000, 10,000 times overdoses. So the therapeutic window, which is the difference between a treatment dose and a fatal dose, extremely high for all of these drugs. Here's a kind of final wrap-up question for all the uh, potential investors, I guess, here. Uh, how far off are we from me going down to Rite Aid and giving a prescription and getting uh, some psilocybin pills that I can take home as part of my daily regimen? <laughs> that, that's pretty far off. Um, well, okay, how far <laughs> off are we from these being an acceptable, yeah. above-board form of, of psychotherapy or treatment? Pro probably four-ish years yeah. between three the three leading edge years. and, and five-ish five -ish plus years to uh, classical psychedelics. So we're, we're, we're years out. And again, I'd say it's a pretty unusual circumstance because we have drugs that are available to you if you know where to look. That you know, uh, Admittedly, I just was responsible for the... the construction of the best acid anyone's ever made, you know? That, <laughs> this is Better like than Owsley acid. <laughs> this, I mean, this is like GMP, this is FDA grade LSD. It's also gonna be the hardest LSD to get, right? And it's gonna be that way for a bunch of years. You're gonna have to be in a research study to access it. So uh, what that commercialization model looks like, how you get it from whom and what setting, that's all stuff that we're gonna have to figure out on the path beyond, you know, with our heads up, looking beyond drug approval to how do we actually make sure that we get this kind of treatment to folks who need it the most, and that better not just be the people at this conference, right? If we're only getting this to people who know how to buy it and can afford it anyway, we're missing the boat. Well, there's an old piece of hippie wisdom that says, know your dealer, and you guys all know Dan now, so you heard it here first, the best LSD in the world. Um, thanks, everyone, for turning out. Thank you. Uh, yeah, stay safe. Enjoy the sun. <laughs>